Hey, what's up shiny, happy, above average viewers? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. We got two spicy home theater topics to cover. First, I want to review a hulked out, unsanctioned soundbar setup that has, let's say, rejuvenated uh, my interest in Sonos as a home theater company. Anyway, which dark forces pushed me to go weird? Well, hedonism, can doing something so wrong sound so right? Second, I am loyal to humans, but I'm always looking to replace my technology wives with newer, sleeker, more skilled technology wives, if you know what I'm saying. Third, I'm quite bitter that I was not sophisticated enough to successfully pre-order a Nakamichi Dragon limited edition unit. Uh, the button just didn't work, so I'm raging. And offering up an alternative, a challenger of sorts, that just may have the juice to pose a legitimate threat. So what is this mystery Sonos arrangement? Well, since you asked so nicely, it's the Sonos Arc with two subs, a Gen 1 and Gen 3, because close enough, two Era 300s paired as rears, and, yes, another and, a generously spaced Era 300 stereo pair up front, grouped, not paired with the ARC soundbar system. So the 300 stereo pair, the black ones here to help differentiate, unlike the paired 300 rears, are not adding discrete channels to the ARC system. So we're not going from a 7.x to a, I don't know, 9.x system here. Just to be clear, that capability is not supported. The front 300s will merely be reproducing what the ARC system is doing, but in the very singular way that the ERA 300s do stereo. Yes, I know, I know from your ivory soundbar philosophy slash judgment tower, this abomination should be immediately dismissed, drawn and quartered in the middle of Best Buy or whatever. Based not only on price, uh, my wallet stands with you on that one, but also the awkward fact that the 300 stereo pair, as mentioned, are redundant, not discrete channels, and present all the sounds, some meant for the front and some for the rear, all up front, which is textbook, home theater, wonky. My response to you, uh, too late, should have spoken up earlier, and I don't care. I know I mentioned slaying the dragon as motivation for this thing I'm doing, but since it's not available for slaying quite yet, it's a shy dragon, my primary question about this setup is as follows. Accounting for the oddities that may arise from the Stereo 300s, as this is a straight up soundbar system monster hardware wise, does the overall sound package considering clarity, detail, soundstage, spatial effects, and immersion, not only meet, but exceed my other two favorite systems, the Sony A9 and the Samsung Q990B making it the undisputed premium soundbar setup a customer can acquire. My hypothesis was yes. Well, that is yes enough to try this out. In a previous video, I ranked the cinema sound of the arc coupled with the ones and sub the most humble amongst four elite soundbar systems. So I'm requesting a monumental leap here. Okay, so before sharing my Sonos experience that I have so deliciously set up, we have to get to the second thing, which I'm sure everyone has forgotten about, except you, of course, with your unwavering steel trap of a mind. If second things aren't for you, you can callously skip to this time to continue on to the Sonos experiment. Clearly all the important and good looking people are still here, so let's continue. Give me a moment to set this up. As my amoeba channel glacially emerges from the darkest parts of the deep, dank internet underworld, companies at times, inexplicably or mistakenly, offer to send me stuff. I've been reliably informed it's good manners if you accept their stuff to talk about it in a video and provide an opinion. So we talk a lot about audio here on this channel and how big spacious sound is one of the finer things in life. Having tested these soundbar systems with many different size screens, let's say 42 inches to 150 inches, I have cultivated the sense that all else being equal, 
the size of the screen is connected to the impact of the sound. So yeah, with this mindset, I'd like to call attention to this 100 inch ambient light rejecting tab tensioned motorized upward rising projector screen by VividStorm. I think this exact model number is no longer on VividStorm's site, though there are very similar models. Um, it can also be purchased on Amazon. In either case, this kind of model can be purchased for about $1,100, including shipping. I'll put links in the description. Full disclosure, I was given this projector screen, but not compensated beyond that. I will freely admit, I don't directly know how this model stacks up relative to competitors with similar specifications. Uh, this is my one and only floor rising projector screen. But I can tell you the pros and cons of this general concept and specific model that hopefully can illuminate whether there is room for something like this in your sacred home theater space. So the pros, the ambient light rejection clearly distinguishes itself from a non-ambient light rejecting screen. It's not just gimmicky snake oil marketing. The win here is that it's watchable in the day, facilitating, for example, sporting event watch parties. Judge Judy, particularly if you don't have a bunch of sunlight shining directly onto the screen. Furthermore, the screen is well tensioned. Let's say it has some advanced wrinkle-free technology built in. And while it's exceedingly thin, crazy thin, it stays in place. Um, it's not gonna go floppity flip-flop on you due to say light airflow from a fan. Another benefit, unlike a TV, this screen can go away in dramatic fashion, of course, with just a push of a button. Um, this serves an aesthetic purpose, avoiding a huge black gray void in your room, but also if you have children in the home, you can protect your investment from balls, bats, bricks, bodies, and spaghetti. So I think intrinsically the whole motorized floor rising concept is rather nifty. Uh, the hardware in this model comes across as quite sturdy with these business oriented supports. It has a showpiece feel to it, but in utilitarian terms, it makes this unit portable-esque eliminating installation and uninstallation frustration associated with ceiling and frame mounted screens. And it's definitely appreciated by me at least that it rolls and unrolls itself and setup is no more than placing and plugging. It's about 60 pounds, so two humans can move it around room to room, house to house with limited strain, avoiding the risk of a broken friendship more associated with moving large old TVs. Cons, uh, first, for the perfect screen tension, you may need to make adjustments, like do mechanical things with your hands with these colorful plastic, yet still unquestionably manly tools. I was a little annoyed when the screen loosened once. Uh, my initial reaction was, well, hmm, it's useless now, off to the dumpster fire, but it is fixable. Though the adjustment mechanism could be more user-friendly as they are buried in this dark hole here. It's difficult to get a sense of exactly what you're doing. I'd say pretty much all my frustration with this product lives in there. And keep in mind, the base is rather long. This one is, I think, 92 to 94 inches, something like that. So its placement and or what you put it on could devolve into a fairly sassy repartee with co-inhabitors. It is designed to sit on a flat surface, ideally a media center, but the floor is an option, though it's not ideal as a viewing angle, nor for placing a soundbar. Other details, Vivid Storm does offer this kind of model for ultra short throw projectors as well. This one is for long throw projectors. The ultra short throw ambient light rejecting screens do cost more as the light rejecting microstructure is more complicated and costly to manufacture. Anyway, I thought this projection screen was an interesting home theater doodad. Uh, hopefully some of you agree. I go into more detail on this product here in this video if you're interested. All right, returning to my first thing. Yes, my transitions are so subtle they're undetectable. Let's talk sound. I think whatever notions there might be floating around out there that the Sonos sound is too domestic, docile, timid, has no quarter with this setup. The sound is big, physical, aggressive, approaching, threatening. 
As far as I'm aware, you can't buy a soundbar system with this much meat and force. It's a sonic tsunami. The officially supported combination, which is the ARC, Aero 300 rears, and dual subs, produces an impressive top tier soundbar sound for sure. But it immediately becomes apparent that something was missing when the front 300s are introduced. It's like living your whole life holding 75% inflated balloons and then being handed a balloon inflated to 110%. In this soundbar setup, somewhat comically, the arc assumes a different role, more like a comrade or team player rather than the clear conceptual centerpiece. The speaker hierarchy is flattened. And while the arc undoubtedly enhances dialogue intelligibility, contributes to height effects, and supports the overall spatial sound mission, it no longer holds the dominant position. Over the past few months, I have come to embrace my deep and unassailable truth. That is that home theater sound is more gratifying when there isn't a single dominant speaker, as is typical in a traditional soundbar setup. This realization has been strongly influenced by my experience with the Sony HTA9 system. I have no desire to know which sound is coming from which speaker. What I truly crave is a hyper-real, uninterrupted, multi-dimensional soundscape where the sounds envelop me in this seamless and balanced manner. For instance, when people are strolling alongside a river, I yearn for the entire soundscape on that side to form an unbroken wall of rushing water. And I must say, uh, this setup often gets eerily close to reaching this mark, undoubtedly surpassing the Q990B and HTA9 performance. When it comes to atmospherics that endow scenes with breath and vibrancy, especially in films like The Revenant, the impact is nothing short of overwhelming. Let's take, for example, the rain and raging rapids in the forest. It transitions from being an intriguing auditory texture with a traditional soundbar setup to something akin to a palpable physical threat. You can almost feel the imminent danger of being swept away or succumbing to hypothermia. It's just that much more dimensional. In terms of 3D audio performance, the height effects were exceedingly strong. The flying car in Blade Runner 2049, when hovering above Sapper Morton's home. Um, well, that was the strongest and most precisely defined height effect I have ever encountered in a soundbar setup. It wasn't just a fleeting moment that I happened to catch. It was persistent. I had to look up. It was quite something. Later in the movie, as I watched Kay walking through the dreary city streets, the advertisement voices were coming at me in what seemed like an unprecedented number of locations. It was a remarkable untethering from speakers. Very wild, all of it. The hyperspatial nature of the sound um, certainly is a distinguishing factor here, but what really drives the intensity is not only the amount of bass, which is immense, but the spatial distribution of the bass. So the two subs up front, left and right, spread far apart, four Era 300s, each bringing a surprising amount of low end for a standalone speaker. Oh, and you know, the ARC, let's not forget about that one. The good news is that you have a very generous range in which to play. You can control the sub level, the stereo 300s, and the entirety of the ARC system base level with separate controls. Two, and this is kind of central, to find that thin line between miraculous and chaos, which is where this setup seems to want to gravitate towards. But it's not only the bass bringing the intensity. This system has an admirable amount of lower mids meat, which keeps the sound from ever sounding flabby or merely punchy. The scene I watched where the weight of the sound was most impactful was the fight scene between Kay and Sapper Morton. Each punch exerted a physicality that nearly obliterated the fourth wall. The contribution of the robust low-end and mid-frequency presence and intricate texture from the tweeters is satisfying, stimulating, and mostly not, but sometimes too much. This fight example really stuck in my head, but have no doubt, every sound effect that is meant to bring intensity to the scene 
ominous music, electronic sounds, explosions, whatever sound Michael Bay makes when walking into a room is amplified with this setup. And as muscular as this system is, the dynamic range is electrifying. The sound on a dime can go from violent chaos to tender to Armageddon. It's a roller coaster. The incorporation of the Era 300s up front, as anticipated, resulted in a striking expansion of the front soundstage, both technically and virtually, thanks to the side firing sound bouncing drivers. This expansion significantly improved the overall spatial uniformity of the sound, creating a more cohesive match with the rear soundstage. Furthermore, the addition of a dedicated center channel via the arc, close enough, ensures the preservation of a dedicated dialogue channel that is widely recognized as essential in a home theater setup. Let's talk directional effects. Well, the lateral effects were certainly widened and made more dramatic with the front 300s. Though, counter to my expectation, I didn't find that the front to back longitudinal effects changed that much when toggling the front 300s on and off. For example, in Mad Max at the end of the dust storm scene when the vehicle Mr. Max was strapped to flies towards you, uh, the directional whoosh felt more impactful and no less front to back directional when the front 300s were active. I got the same result over and over again, whether it be cars racing towards or away from me, flying cars whooshing over my head, love those flying cars, gunshot whizzes past my ear, you know, the usual sound object suspects. The extra 300s up front didn't obviously screw up what I feared they would, which is good, but disconcerting in a way. How could that be? I don't totally know. Going into this wayward expensive exercise, I was most worried about reverb, in particular voice reverb. Even a slight offset between the 300s and the ARC system could, could pretty, pretty much, much render, render this experiment, experiment dead on arrival. In short, this was at most a very minor issue. Sometimes the reverb was unidentifiable. Other times it was clearly there, but it always perceptually went away immediately after lowering the front 300s volume to let's say seven to 10% lower than the arc system volume. From my experience, you would always want this kind of volume gap anyway. Um, this two entity system sounds its best when the front 300s are deferential to the ARC system, as you might expect. A reasonable question is whether Atmos is supported on the ARC system and the stereo 300s when they're grouped. As far as I can tell, yes, by ear and with this confirmation. Though whatever I heard, as far as I'm concerned, does not need that badge to be legitimized. Music performance, yeah, it's a spectacle to say the least. I'm not Sure, if you want raves amongst your home theater setup, but I think this can support that if you swing that way. You get a surprising thickness to the sound along with admirable levels of separation and fizzy texture. Usually you don't get all of these. As my average viewer seems to be exactly my age, um, I'm guessing your parties like mine mostly involve people trying to find a quiet space so they can sit and talk about issues unrelated to your new sound system. So my recommendation with this setup, because it does offer a unique and thrilling experience, though maybe best served in moderate doses, from time to time, take 20 minutes just for you to sit and just listen to your favorite music in your sweet spot. It's a perk you should not forget to access. Okay, the overarching narrative regarding the sound. There is this psychological theory that we feel most driven, focused, exhilarated, when we are operating near the border of capability and potential, order and chaos. So think of a talented musician pushing an improvisation to the max. This phenomenon is in some sense embedded in this setup. If you have the volume set generously and you are watching an action packed movie, you will be presented with an unmatched wild ride that with the right EQ and volume levels stays on the track. At the end, you might justifiably think I have participated in the outer boundary of what soundbar systems can do. 
but pushed a little further, you might walk away saying it was fun until my roller coaster car landed in the parking lot. Obviously your temperament plays into this interpretation, but even if you are game for that on the edge experience, expect to fiddle around with levels more so than with other soundbar systems. Yes, I sense this setup is positioned best to serve the big epic kinetic movies, but it also enriches your slower paced dramas by making them feel more spacious and more tactile with its ability to skillfully emphasize atmosphere. There's flexibility with the system. Okay, this whole experiment started out in my head as a half joke, but now I'm worried I'm gonna have to keep this configuration. The A9 is officially on ice down here. I'm just excited to explore this Sonos setup with lots more movies and streaming shows. Dang, I, I might even have to play a video game. I'm that hot and bothered. This unofficial unsanctioned configuration, maybe not on every detail, but overall, surpasses the A9 and Q990B in sound performance. Moreover, as I suspected, the Nakamichi Dragon just doesn't strike me as an obvious winner in my imaginary battle. The high-end soundbar system concept, I humbly suggest, needs to evolve beyond the soundbar only upfront model and more often adopt a multi-speaker front solution to really compete with what I presented here. I know this question's gonna come up, so I'll answer. I did try the hundreds and fives in front as stereo pairs as well. I think the hundreds effectively widened the front soundstage, they thickened the sound a bit, um, they added a touch of atmosphere and generally didn't screw things up. So yeah, give it a try. Um, both the 300s and 5s had a major impact on the sound. Uh, the 300s impact is more stunning and costs less, so skip the 5s. In terms of a buying recommendation in regards to the semi-illegal setup, for the insatiable enthusiasts out there, I actually do recommend doing this if you recently inherited a bunch of money. Um, you just have to keep in mind that the TV remote will not change the 300's volume level along with the arc. And the consistent EQ adjusting that is necessary when pushing the system to the limit requires a particular kind of patience that may not hold during everyday use. I would not put this in my main living space, but rather in a secondary cinema-oriented play space where some usability awkwardness is merely a divot in your hardcore sound adventure. Okay, fine, so here's my opinion on the best soundbar system without the extra front speakers. The contenders are the ARC with the 300 rears and sub, the Sony HGA9 with the SA SW5 sub module, and the Samsung Q990B. Unfortunately, I think we have something approaching a one ABC situation with each having unique strengths and weaknesses. Well, okay, the B wins because I'm hesitating and it's by far the cheapest. But if I had three doors and was told you are stuck with your decision forever, I would choose the A9. I just can't get over how much I like the wide front soundstage along with its precision. The ARC system and Q990B just don't do that. Though between the ARC and Q990B, I do think that the B is probably laboratory technically better, but I'm still kind of more intrigued with the 300 effect, which continues to unravel its mysteries. I suppose a Q990C arc with 300 battle is warranted. You might rightfully think that this video was silly beyond comprehension. Just because you're correct doesn't save you from being a bad person. Nonetheless, I think I was able to confirm my suspicion that there is something to this. And Sonos needs to take a good hard long think on supporting something like what I hacked together here, um, considering how thrilling it sounds, even when executed as abominably as I did. Sonos, let's say at a minimum, let's support a quad era 300s configuration with a port light control box with HDMI eARC. Even better, support something like my setup using the soundbar as the control box and find a way to make the three front speakers complement each other, you know, acting as discrete channels. It seems to me this is a great opportunity to take the top dog spot and make even more money accessorizing the arc. Okay, before heading out, um, I'd like to address the 300 lazy tweeter scandal as I completely failed to discuss this in my last review. 
If you're using the 300s as rears, at least at the time of this recording, the front driver, which is a tweeter, takes a nap, which is at best weird and at worst cold-blooded betrayal. Everyone buying the 300 should expect that this side of the speaker, you know, the side with the humongous oval with the Sonos logo on it, will make sound in both music and home theater contexts. Hopefully Sonos will figure this out soon. All that being said, I think the 300 is the best soundbar rear speaker you can acquire right now. All right, gonna wrap up this installment of my inner 15 year old soundbar fan fiction vlog. If this video offered some value, please interact with the engagement boosters and help me reach my 20,000 subs by 2024 goal so I can prove to my wife I could hit that number without taking off my clothes. Let's not let it come to that. Thanks for watching, catch you on the next one.